podcast part Memories of Oldenshire. My name is Violet. Well, we finally recovered our memories of Holdenshire, only to learn that our friend Belton was attacked in his wagon on the road to Blackford. We're about to set off from Hengistbury to find out what's happened to him. We'd like to set out after Belton. I have six supply out of eight, so I, I would like to go ahead and just to be on the safe side, buy another two supply. After having saved the town from kobolds, maybe they'll cut us some kind of a break on this. <laughs> These people are very happy that you were there to help out. Their gratitude probably would extend to some kind of a discount. Cool. I would like to purchase two supplies worth of provisions just so I'm a maxed out. Wyvin has eight. He'll just stick with that. Can I scavenge any crossbow bolts for my hand crossbow? I'm going to ask you to make a um, a D100 roll. 50% chance, yes. 50% chance, no. 31. Most of them are either ill-fitted to your crossbow or are broken or, or burned, actually, considering the kind of situation that most of the kobolds have been wreaking havoc throughout the town. So, unfortunately not. Before we leave town, Tlingbet would like to, especially since they're this river here, see if he can replace his missing net. I mean, you do see that the, the fisher folk have nets. Maybe you could convince one of them who may, in fact, be really enamored with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh... Yeah, I'll go find his uh, his sort of sweetheart and, you know, explain to her, you know. I whisper, it's Ariadne. Her name's Ariadne. <laughs> <laughs> Women like that when you remember their names. <laughs> I, get, I get very flustered. That's what I've been doing wrong. Uh. <laughs> he does go find uh, Ariadne and, and just, I, I'm sorry that I, I didn't come up when everybody called everyone's names. I was just, it was very overwhelming and try and smooth things over a little bit before he actually asks her for stuff. (laughs) (laughs) She finds you absolutely adorable, especially with all of your heroics. I don't think that there's any real need to roll here. Yeah. You won't begrudge him a net, surely. The man practically bled to death for this town. (laughs) (laughs) She just grabs a woven net, gives it to you, and as she gives it to you, she just holds onto your hand and says, Take care. Slingbet looks her deeply in the eye and does his best, most earnest return of her her look and, and says, I will treasure this always. Adorable. Can they tell us how far outside of Hengisbury is the site of the crashed wagon? Sure, yeah. The messenger says that he found the crashed wagon 60 miles east. So not fully all the way to the town of Blackford. By the way, supply costs, uh, supply is just rations, right? So supply will cost you five silver pieces. But because you guys are in with the town, it'll only cost you three. Cool. Six silver pieces then for two of those. Done. I I will do the same because I thought I had seven, but on my sheet it says five, so I will buy two. Mm -hmm. We ate some on the way here from uh, Northminster, yeah. Uh, Yes, Tlingvet likewise discovers that he can in fact carry more supply than he thought he would, so I will likewise get two. How much is a crossbow bolt? I only have two silver left, so... (laughs) Ammunition. So they come in packs of 20, and it's one gold piece for 20 crossbow bolts. But because you guys have this amazing discount, six silver pieces. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I will give you a gold piece, which is what I have. You can give me four silver back. I can give you two, and the guy can give you four. So Okay. <laughs> I would love to buy a, a sling or something if I can. Uh, I think that you could definitely buy a sling. Slings are, are relatively cheap. I mean, kids have them. The cost of a sling is two silver pieces. You get the 50% discount or thereabouts, so it's only one silver piece. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll get do you need some, some ammunition I for do. I need sling? some bullets. The bullets also come in packs of 20 because they're just basically rocks or pieces of of slag. They're only four copper pieces for 20. So in your case, two copper. Great. I will produce the fairy love letter that I was given and I will open it and inhale the floral perfume and read the first few lines of text and use it to cast druid craft, which it seems to be able to cast. And I would like to know what the weather will be like today. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> that is true. That is something you can do with Druidcraft. Oh, that's very Mercury. The weather is going to actually be sort of misty today, perhaps coming out of the fog moors to the south. I will communicate that to everybody just to be prepared to keep a sharp lookout because it's going to be a foggy ride to Blackford. So Tlingbet also has a couple things that he would like to you know, try and do before we leave town. Tlingbet, as one of his abilities, has an exploration knack that is herbal bitters. So he can spend an hour collecting natural ingredients and brewing two servings of a drink that only lasts for 24 hours, so it's good for a short amount of time. But when we drink it, it reduces fatigue by a level. It's one of those things that's kind of good to have on hand before we head out if we can do that. Basically, he's going to be able to, you know, hand hand somebody a drink and be like, this is going to taste terrible, but you'll feel better. (laughs) (laughs) He'd like to go do that and use that ability. He has a second exploration knack. If he can find a beast with a small beast or a medium sized beast with a challenge rating of an eight or less, he can spend 10 minutes befriending it. And then he can become its guardian ranger and um, it will be loyal to him. It still acts independently. It won't like fight for him or anything. Sure. But it will be his little buddy. What's the challenge rating? It has to be less than what? One eighth. So we're looking for like a a squirrel or a mouse or or a bird or something. Let's let's go real weird for this and look for like a beetle. A beetle. Oh, I like Like it. A nice, a nice, like big, juicy beetle. So yeah, he's gonna he's gonna look for a bug and spend ten minutes talking to his bug and uh, befriend it. <laughs> you can talk to the bug. Does the bug like talk back to you, or does it just understand? It follows Tlingbet and becomes loyal to him, but it does not. It's it's not gonna talk to him or anything. It's otherwise just just a bug. <laughs> yeah, you find like one of these like what are they what are they called um those elephant uh elephant beetles or rhino beetles? Awesome. Yeah. Rhinoceros beetle, they're awesome, yeah. I love the way that they look, so I think that we should use them. So, absolutely, you go into the forest and there's a rhinoceros beetle that just, like, catches your eye and crawls up onto your arm. Immediately, you just feel a kinship with this bug. My new best friend, Slingbet, like, scratches its little beetle head in the way that he believes that beetles enjoy. Do you give it a name? Legs. Legs the beetle. Love it. Some can lift up to 100 times their own weight. That's incredible. That's crazy. Nice. Though they have trouble moving at that point. Okay, so they can bench <laughs> they can bench it, but they can't carry it around. Mort, do you have a new friend? Yes, everyone. This is this is Legs. He will be traveling with us for some time. Oh, that's amazing. Mort, would you like to meet Legs? I, I'm gonna hold Mort up to Legs. I hope he likes fog and mist. <laughs> Quivin makes a face. He's from the city. He doesn't like bugs, so he's like, Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Oh, Roach. Gwyvin. I'm sorry to break it to you, Gwyvin, but plenty of bugs in the city. <sighs> Gets the shivers, walks away. <laughs> yeah, I think we should try to borrow or rent a wagon. A horse pulling a wagon would be the way to go here. A wagon will cost 35 gold pieces. Well, we sure don't have that. We'll inquire with Maiko to see if he might be able to hook us up with somebody who might be making a run between Hengisbury and Blackford and wouldn't mind taking on exactly. some passengers for uh, a fee. When you get back to the Hen and Philly and speak about the fact that Belton is gone, I mean, he's absolutely distraught. He even goes so far as to say that as a reward, since business has been quite good, he will offer you 100 gold pieces if you bring him back. I thank him for his generosity. I ask if he will give us an advance on that to pay for Ah. Like, like the wagon to take us out there. That's a fair request. I'd say that if you make a persuasion check with advantage, you may do it. First attempt was an eight, but I do have advantage. A 22. Michael looks at you and says, yes, I mean, I'll give you the other 50 if you bring him back. Please, please. I mean, he's my only cousin. He's, he's, he's our friend as well. He's done a lot for us. We're just as anxious as you are. Yes, I, I completely understand here. And he puts out a small bag and you look inside and there's 50 gold pieces there. Awesome. So with this, then, we will rent ourselves a wagon and draft horse. So you guys will now set out from Hankisbury. As you travel along the road, you see the town of Hankisbury disappearing behind you. You pass by what seems to be, after maybe about six or seven miles, the edge of the forest, the weirwood on the north and a smaller forested area to the south. And then after another seven or eight miles, 
day turns into the afternoon. An abandoned outpost or manor, you're not quite sure. It seems to be sort of older house that is just barely standing. Its, its timbers are old and either rotten or burned. You're not quite sure at this distance, but clearly that nobody's inside of it any longer. I'd like you all to make perception checks. Mercury with a six. Lingbet, nine. Violet got a 19. Wyvern also got a 19. So, Violet and Gwyvern, you look up towards this house, you see little creatures moving around inside of it. This distance, you just see sort of little figures moving around inside of the house. Um, there seem to be little creatures in that house. Am I seeing things? No, we should stop. Do you think so? Can you tell what kind of creatures? Can't tell, no. They're just sort of small figures moving around. I'm in favor of pressing on until we can reach the wagon. What if there's other travelers here? Let me take a peek. Wyvern is suggesting that he would like to sneak up. Make a stealth check. You jump off the wagon. Oof, 11. You guys watch as Gwyvern attempts to be sneaky and stealthy, but you see him making a large divot through the bush. <laughs> you just hear like, yeah, exactly. Crunching branches are just snapping under your feet. By the time you reach this house, Gwyvern, you don't see anybody outside of it and you do not hear or see anyone within. It's obvious whatever within there hurt me. He's going to ready his crossbow, but go back slowly, but with his crossbow ready in case something comes after him. Go back to the wagon. So you edge back down the slope to the wagon. What's your passive perception? 12. You turn back towards the wagon, and you feel something cold and wet hit the back of your head. Ah! I reach back. What is it? Your hand comes away from the back of your head, and you look at your hand, and it's covered with this sort of like purplish red goo. Ooh. Did it hurt? Did it burn? Didn't hurt. It just felt cold and wet. Ah, he wipes it off because it's disgusting. Ugh. And then he's going to make his way back to the wagon as fast as he can. Was it everything you hoped for? What were those things? <laughs> he shows them the purplish <laughs> goo and as he's wiping it off. Oh, could I have some of that? He <laughs> gives her all she wants. He wrings the rag <laughs> out that he's using. in a vial. <laughs> Cork it. Amazing. And <laughs> I said, listen, there could be all sorts of things along this road and in this region, but... I think our best course is to make it to the crash site first, and perhaps from there we could try to track Belton. Whatever's going on in that house could have nothing to do with him. As he's taking the purplish goo out of his hair, he's just nodding like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> That's true, but that was first-class goo gathering, so thank you. Slingbed, would, would legs like any of this goo? Oh, that's a good question. Slingbed looks, looks at legs on his shoulder and then looks at Mercury and says, you, you don't know anything about beetles, do you? Not a thing. Legs is an herbivore, and I'm not sure what this goo is. It could be herbs. Do we know what the goo is? <laughs> Make a nature check. Uh, ten. No idea. Doesn't oh, smell good, though. So it's goo. But he'll make sure he cleans it off. You do notice that coming off of the fog moor to the southwest, there are these clouds of mist that are rolling in your direction. The night is coming on apace. You enter a new region, so I'm going to ask, if you'd like, if you want to do any kind of journey activities. Oh, sure. fun. I'm also going to let you know the DC for the journey activities. Each region has their own DC. The DC for the activities will be 15. We're in a tier two region, at least. Actually, according to this, it's a tier one region. So DC, should, DC should be 12, then. It specifically says DC 15. This fucking road is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pray to the trickster. Please, trickster, if it so please you, keep us safe from goo, except Gwyvern, if it's funny. Uh, feel <laughs> free to continue to pelt him with goo. Please watch over the beetle, and please let things work out between Talingbed and Ariadne. I'm doing everything I can in that direction, and I hope you noticed how I won that Toastmaster contest without using deception just like you like. <laughs> Religion check. Oh, only a 12. If only this was a tier one region. Unfortunately, the trickster does not listen. I do it myself. Talingbet will take a, sh a shot at scouting to try and just kind of get a feel for what we might be coming up to and make sure that nobody is preparing to rob us on the road or anything. So you hop off the wagon and go ahead a couple hundred feet. Go ahead and make a perception check. Talingbet heads out with legs on this brave adventure, and <laughs> and crit fails. Oh, oh no! no. <laughs> this is the first crit failure for a journey activity that, that we've gotten so far. 
unfortunately, there are repercussions. You guys wait for Tlingbet to come back after he crests the hill and, you know, you wait for about 20 minutes. 20 minutes turns into 30 minutes, turns into 45 minutes. You're like, what happened to Tlingbet? Meanwhile, Tlingbet, you sort of wandered into the brush. The mist has sort of accumulated around you in a way that you've completely gone off the road. You do unfortunately get lost. Takes about an hour before you come back to the wagon, but by then you've suffered a level of fatigue. This is the first time we're using the fatigue condition here on Level Up Vest 5th Edition. The first level of fatigue is that you cannot sprint or dash until that fatigue goes away. Now, the way that you can remove fatigue is usually through leave a long rest, but there are other mechanics that can remove fatigue as well. Tling that wanders wanders back, just like, oh, it was it was terrible. There's there's so many trees and the mist and I just oh legs legs got lost. I was following his directions. Oh no. <laughs> I thought it might be legs. Yes. Don't we have something that gets rid of fatigue? Yeah, I have a tin of granny apple seeds signature pastries, but if we're just about to long rest anyway. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Um, then might as well hang on to that. Since Gwyvin is getting bored waiting for him to come back, he is going to he's going to try to harvest. He thinks he's smarter than he is, but he's going to try to find some sort of healing plants or something like that. harvest. Absolutely. You can make a, either a medicine or nature check to find plants. Stay close to the wagon and look around the different plants and see if he can find. That's a 15. Well, the DC is a 15, so that's a success. Ooh. Cool. You do find some interesting looking leafy plants that you know are probably able to, if you have something like a healer's satchel, that you could use that to make a medicine check. It's basically like a healer's kit. He does not, but does anybody else, anybody else has that, he'll more than happily give that over. I don't. I have an herbalism kit. I don't have a healer's kit. Yeah, nor do I, unfortunately. Yeah, likewise, I have five herbalism. Another way that you could potentially use these plants, Gwyvin, is that you could use it as a herbalism kit or a poisoner's kit. I think he would give them to Violet just because he thinks she gathers all this weird stuff. So he'll give it to Violet. Thank you. While everybody's looking around and such, I'm going to um, rummage around in my bag and find some scrap fabric. And I'm going to make... Mort, it's a little bit foggy and chilly, so I'm going to make Mort a little scarf and also a little (laughs) bag because I have a sewing kit and (laughs) a little bag so that if any piece of him should fall off and I'm not there to notice right away, he could put them in the bag and then save them (laughs) and I could fix him later. Before turning in, I will read the love letter and sniff the perfume again and cast Druidcraft to see what the weather will be like tomorrow oh you can do that for the next day that's fantastic <laughs> it's a, it's next 24 hours fantastic yeah it will actually be still misty tomorrow i don't need that scarf it's a continuing misty with a chance of mist throughout the day <laughs> <laughs> i'm reading this letter right <laughs> <laughs> Day turns to dust, dust turns to night. You successfully take long rests uh, so that fatigue goes away. Fantastic. You all individually need to, however, remove one supply. Right. In the middle of your second day, after having woken up again to this same mist, you are surprised to see a shape off to the side of the road. It's just a big pile of wood, essentially. It's just wood that has been splintered and broken and it is destroyed. Oh no. I mean, we rode in Belton's wagon all the way here. Do we do we recognize it to be the remains of the wagon? You do, unfortunately. Oh, no. The wagon itself, the front axle of the wagon is in absolute splinters, and you don't even need to make a survival check. You see that the reason why it's sort of off to the side of the road and there are these giant gouges in the ground, it looks like it's been run off the road and crashed into something. Rummy Nose, the horse that brought you here, is seemingly long gone, as are whatever supplies, all those bed rolls and things that he brought with him and other things that Belton had stashed away on the wagon. As you sort of search around the wagon, Violet, you come across a knife embedded in the driver's seat or the remains of it. Oh, no. Looks like it's about the size of a knife that a halfling would probably use. 
Perhaps it's Belton's knife. What's worse is as you pull it off the driver's seat, you see that it was pinning something in place. A fluttering piece of gray-purple cloth with it. Oh, no. We know not to get into the back of wagons with guys wearing gray-purple cloths. Because they're in a cult. Oh, no. Who's good at engineering? Gwyvin. Yes. Yes. Make an engineering check as you guys are discussing this. On the wagon itself? Just make an engineering check. Um, Well, because I have gadgetry, which hmm, considered a gadget. It's not really a gadget, so you can just make an engineering check. It's fine. Would you shut up and make an engineering check? (laughs) (laughs) Everything in negotiation with you. Yeah, well, motherfuckers, I got a 22. <laughs> all right, all right. Damn. Without my D4. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like there's no indication that Romino's actually broke loose on her own. And as you look around, you all don't see any sign of halfling footprints anywhere. Uh, he was raptured. So somebody... um. <laughs> Somebody, somebody released unhitched. the horse. Yeah, somebody unhitched Rummy Nose. Can, can I look around and see, like, are there any any tracks at all? I understand there are no halfling tracks. Make a survival check. I will give myself guidance on this. Okay, that is a base 10, but hold on, I do get guidance. All right on. Total of 13. You take a couple minutes. At first, you don't see anything. But as the mist starts to clear, you are able to see that there are tracks, not only of Rummy Nose, who seems to be running east along the road, towards Blackford, but you also see, Mercury, the tracks of a second wagon making its way off the road. Oh, no. And towards the Crawley Hills. Gross. What the hell are the <laughs> Crawley Hills? You guys oh. went through the Crawley Hills. What are you talking about? You didn't even know where Sorry. you went. Gwyvin, I got it. I got it, Clyvin. Is Just it a gadget, make an engineering check when I ask you to make <laughs> <laughs> The Crawley Hills are a gadget. We'll get you five. That's right there, Andy. Happy New Year. The show will be back shortly for the second half. We hope you're enjoying Podcast Party Memories of Holdenshire, presented by Cast Party and EN Publishing. For this series, we're using Level Up Advanced 5th Edition, For more info on these cool new rules and enhancements for your 5th edition D&D games, visit levelup5e.com. If you're a new listener and you're enjoying this adventure, you should also check out Podcast Party Descent into Avernus, as Dungeon Master Matt Gordon leads us to hell and, well, hopefully back, in a quest to save the stolen city of Elturel from eternal damnation. We have almost two years of episodes available now, and new episodes come out right in this feed every other Monday. Hey, have you ever wanted to track down a kidnapped halfling like our heroes are doing in this episode? Well, Cast Party's professional dungeon masters are available to hire for online games. We have games for kids as well as adults, and our DMs can run almost any of the official Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition adventures, as well as third-party adventures, and some we've created ourselves. Check us out at cast-party.com and follow us on Facebook at Cast Party D&D, on Twitter at Cast Party 2, on Instagram at Cast underscore Party, or on TikTok at Cast underscore Party. As always, we're offering monthly free online adventures with our Dungeon Masters. These free games fill up quickly, so if you'd like to grab a spot, you should join our email list or our Discord server. Links to both can be found at cast-party.com. You can also watch episodes on YouTube, complete with artwork, battle maps, character portraits, and even a little bit of animation. You can also catch episodes of our monthly chat show, Power Word Talk, on our YouTube channel as well. Check out the show notes for the link or visit cast-party.com. Thanks very much for listening. And now back to our adventure in the Crawley Hills. You follow this trail for about 10 or 15 miles. The ruts caused by this wagon are pretty deep in the road. Whatever was in it seems to have been pretty heavy. You are luckily able to trace this wagon up into the Crawley Hills. And now that day has turned into afternoon and afternoon has actually turned into dusk, you find that the trail has led you to a stone barrow crouching at the foot of a forested hill. 
This barrow once seems to have had a stacked stone-walled courtyard, but most of it has actually crumbled or probably been harvested for building material. Now the area is choked with stinging nettles, thistle, and other vegetation. That same worn wagon path leads up to the entrance of this barrow with a very familiar covered wagon parked in front. I would like all of you to make perception checks, please. Gwyvin rolled a 10. Mercury rolled a 4. Violet rolled a 13. And Twingbet has an 11. Violet, perhaps with the fact that you're just closer to the ground than everyone else, you're able to spot, while looking at this cart, handprints, smeared handprints on the side of it. Almost as if someone was touching the cart, looking at the ground around it. You spot boot prints in the dust that actually presage your coming, meaning that you're actually following someone else's footprints of someone else's boot tracks to this point. Someone who wasn't on the wagon. Hmm. Oh, someone else following the wagon. That's correct. Someone else who beat you here. Someone's been here before us. When you say that this wagon looks familiar, do you mean it's the wagon that we remember seeing the man in the blue cloak in, in Hengistbury? Yes, the purple cloak, but that is absolutely correct. You remember boarding this wagon, having some kind of a, an interlude or communication with this man in the purple cloak, and then your memories end. How big are the footprints? Do they seem to be of human size or halfling or? Bigger than halfling. They are humanoid size. Hmm. Is there still a horse here with this wagon? No, there is not. Does the wagon look broken down? No, it looks in very good shape, actually. Can we search the wagon? Investigation checks if you'd like. I got a four. Gwyvin got a seven. Talingbet got a five. Violet rolled a 20. Again, Violet to the rescue. Drawn on by that sort of coppery smell that is both revolting and yet somehow uh, familiar and maybe a little bit uh, entrancing, Violet, you yes. get into the wagon and sort of start looking around the floorboards up along the sides of the walls of the covered wagon, and there are flecks of dried blood all over it. Oh no, somebody's been injured or attacked. This wagon is covered in little bits of blood. Do you see it? Violet, can you tell how fresh it is? Can I? Based on the 20, some of the blood is fresh, meaning perhaps a couple of hours. Some of it's quite old, actually. Weeks, maybe even months. Oh, there's been a lot of bleeding in this cart over time. But there is some that is fresher than the others, so we should be cautious. Now, to Lingbet... Yes. Just to show you how much I've grown uh, as a person over the past uh, days, um, I know that that's a, that's a barrow where they put dead people. Right. And it's at the base of this hill, and that probably means that there is only one way in and out. But the architect wants you to go into the barrow this way. But as you know, I've always right. been a little bit suspicious of architecture, so I'd just like to take a quick scan around, Matt, to see if there is any other entrance or exit nearby that's maybe hidden besides kind of going in the front door of the barrow. Can I try perception for that? Uh, yeah, I'll allow perception. That's fine. Well, a seven. Yeah, as far as you can tell, you only see one entrance. Right. As I said, straight ahead. Matt, is this open or is there a door? It is an open hole. A dark hole. But because you have dark vision, you can sort of see that the hole descends into the barrow, you see steps that were carved from the open hole down inside. Okay, because I was going to say Gwyvin's going to sneak up and peek in. Not go in, just peek in. See how far he can see. With your dark vision, you are able to see that the steps descend about 20 feet into what seems to be a man-made chamber with walls. And there is, in fact, a stone door directly facing you. There's a door. How wide is the entrance to the barrow? The entrance is five feet wide, so it would be enough to go one abreast. Okay. Would anyone like to go first? Gwyvin will go. If Gwyvin will go first, I will follow him. So I'm going sneaky. Yeah, go ahead and give me a stealth check. I will give guidance to Gwyvin. 
Great. You should all be sneaky. Gwyvin, you can add a four to your stealth check. Gwyvin got a 19 on his stealth check. The order is Gwyvin, Tlingbet, Mercury, Violet. Mercury got a 16 on his stealth check. Violet got a 15. Tlingbet's stealth is a 19. All right. Very nice. Nice. Not bad at Good all. Good set of stealth rolls. Gwyvin, you descend down the stairs. Tlingbet follows five feet behind, then Mercury, then Violet. The four of you move down this rather short hallway. How far do you go into the chamber? The chamber itself is about 15 feet deep by probably 20 feet wide. Okay, so when Gwyvin gets to the bottom of the stairs, he's going to look on the ground for any kind of footprints to see if someone else walked in a certain direction or a pattern or whatever, because he's paranoid about traps now since he sets off every trap. (laughs) Yeah, make an investigation check. While he's doing that, Matt, I would just like to listen and see if I hear any sounds from ahead of us. Make a perception check. Ooh, Gwyvin rolled a 24 on his investigation. He's really paranoid. All right. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Mercury got a 23 on uh, listening for noise ahead of us. Yes. Investigating this area, Gwyvin, you see that the area is full of detritus, rocks, loose earth, gravel, nothing beyond that. Definitely don't see any traps in this area. And then for you, Mercury, you wait for it to be extremely quiet. The air almost sort of vibrates because it's just so quiet and still. And then, wait a minute, you hear the sound of a voice. You can't really tell what it's saying. It seems to be pretty far off. The tone of the voice seems quite angry, frustrated. I silently tap both to Lingbet and Violet, since they're in front and behind me, and just point ahead to the door and then point to my ear to make sure that they have heard that there's an angry voice coming from behind that door. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lingbet just nods. Gwyvin will proceed to the door, but he doesn't see any tracks or blood flecks or anything like that on the ground. No tracks, no blood flecks. Okay. He'll go slowly to the door. You walk five feet towards the door. You come within five feet of the door. And we're staying pretty tight on him. Like if he moves into the room, we, we come with him. Yeah. Tlingbet's going to be right over his shoulder. Yep. Gwyvin, uh, you look right behind you. Telling bets right behind you, Mercury, you're still sort of in the passageway, and Violet, you are behind probably 10 feet from the actual entrance, when out from the gravel and rock, the ground underneath you, Gwyvin, an enormous pincer erupts out of the ground and absolutely blasts you almost off of your feet. You stare as this thing burrows as swift as any burrowing creature you've ever seen. But this thing is absolutely enormous. It's about 10 feet tall. It has a carapace of sort of a dark reddish orange color. It has oh no, enormous long arms ending in claws. And its body has a sort of insectoid abdomen that follows behind it. Its head has a set of eight blinking black eyes. Whoa. And as it stares, it shrieks. I don't, I don't like this. I don't like it at all. We know, we know you don't like it. (laughs) Go ahead and roll initiative for me, folks. Do you have a plus one to initiative from remembering your memory? With the plus one bonus, Mercury got a seven. And Tlingbet has a 14. Wyvin has an 11. I rolled a 19, but if you add the plus one, it would be a 20. Does this thing get a strike strike on me before we go? It does, unfortunately, because it was under the ground, and so it does get a whack at you. First attack against Gwyvin. That's a claw attack. It's a 23 to hit. Oh, Jesus. Oh, no. That is 12. Oh, my God, 12? It's 12 slashing damage. Oh, no. Bam, down to two. You guys watch as this thing just clamps onto Gwyvin's leg. Gwyvin screams in panic and pain, and Get then it. this thing just burrows up to its its full height. Violet, you're first. You see this thing from the stairs. What do you do? What the? And then I'm going to cast Magic Missile. It's worthwhile mentioning that Gwyvin is, in fact, grappled by this creature in its pincer-like claw. Go ahead and roll your damage for Magic Missile. Does 15 points of damage. Take that. Get your pincers off my friend. I'm going to stay on the stairs. Tling bed, you're up. 
So, Tlingbet, were he to happen to use a uh, cone of lightning, would he be able to aim that in such a way to miss Gwyvin while still hitting the much larger creature? I'll say this, if you move to the corner of the room, which would still be within reach of the creature, you could do it. All right, so Tlingbet's gonna move over to the corner of the room, take a deep breath, and sneeze like <laughs> this thing. <laughs> Giant, horrible sneeze. Lightning-infused snot flies at this creature, needs to make a dexterity saving throw. It makes it with a 15, unfortunately, but I believe it does half damage. It does, in fact. So it would have been eight damage. It's only going to do four. All right, four lightning four is damage. better than nothing. Anything else to Lingbet? That's it. He just kind of, like, wiped his nose of the, uh, the snot. <laughs> Gwyvin, <laughs> you are stuck in the claw of this creature. If you want to get out of it, you're going to have to make an escape roll, so acrobatics or athletics. Gwyvin is definitely going to try to escape this thing. That'll be your action, though. 23. Yep, you just roll right out of the creature's grasp. Yay! And then I'm going to use my bonus action to disengage, and then can I move back through my friends all the way up the stairs? Bleeding the whole way. <laughs> and that's my turn. Well, here comes the creature. It looks like it's now its turn. Yeah, now, now Tlingbet's the only one chilling with it. Yeah, I'm sure this is fine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the creature just turns towards Tlingbet in the corner. It just swivels, and then it moves its front carapace section towards you and opens its jaws. You see there's all kinds of sticky green goop inside of its mouth, and it comes over to you and swipes at you with its claws and rolls a 19. Tlingbet kind of like does his best to try and back into the corner and avoid getting hit by the claw and just kind of bend it off and go, ah, ah. That is not that much damage, actually. It's only five damage. I rolled double ones on I'll the eights. All right. Wow. Yeah. But because it hits you, you are now grappled. Oh. Ah, oh, gross. Let go. Mercury, your turn. I close my eyes for a moment and I say, Trickster, I'm sorry to bother you. No, you've got a lot on your mind. Very busy, lots of different balls in the air at the moment, but if you could spare a glance away to keep your servant safe, I would greatly appreciate it. And I will cast Shield of Faith on myself. That is a bonus action. That will bump up my armor class by two. Then with my action, I conjure that torch flame in the center of my palm, and I stare towards the insect creature, and I hurl it towards the monster. Oof, only a 12. 12 will not hit. Yeah, I'm not going to get any closer to it, unfortunately, so that's that's my turn. Violet, it's your turn. We're back to top of the order. I can't wait to pick you apart and look at your insides and use you for experiments. And I'm going to cast... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cast Magic Missile again. It's a three, so that's a total of nine, nine points of damage. And I'll stay where I am. To Link Bet, you're grappled by this creature. You cannot move unless you escape. You're not restrained, so you can attack without disadvantage, but you are still grappled. You know what? I have seen uh, this thing looking at me hungrily. I think I'm just going to try try and stab it with my short sword. Stabs at this thing that is holding on to him, and he has a 23 to hit. That All will right. Hit. Roll your damage. And that's nine damage. Ooh. Very nice. Yeah, this thing is definitely weakening. That stabs into the body of this thing. It's like, ah, let go, let go, let go, let go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this thing opens its mouth wide. You see it's sort of chittering like it's going to bite your head off. Gwyvin, it's your turn. Gwyvin's going to pull out his hand crossbow and he's going to take a shot at it. At the 14. 14 is target. Yay. Six piercing damage plus my sneak attack. I get another one point, so seven points of piercing damage. <laughs> because it only had seven hit points left. Amazing. Oh, revenge. And just <laughs> as this thing was a, just a bite to Lingbet's head off, it slumps to the ground and just stops moving. All right. Oh. So going to stab it one oh. more time. Just so you stab it. It sort of makes a reflexive swat at you, but it, it, that was just sort of its final throws. How are you, Gwyvin? I cast Healing Word on Gwyvin real quick. Gwyvin recovers six hit points. I only peripherally notice that Gwyvin's dying because I am running over there and pulling parts off and putting them in my bag. <laughs> I, I run across the room quickly and I want to listen at the door 
to see if anyone is coming, if I heard that fight and is coming towards us. Make a quick perception check. A six on the perception check. Do you hear nothing? Well, that probably made quite a racket, so. I heard yelling in there before and I don't hear anything now. Maybe they're afraid of us. Right. Hmm. I'm going to use its mandibles to make a sort of harp, like a little harp, and I can put its little tendons in there. I've seen it done once. I've never done it, but I'm certainly going to make it out of this motherfucker. That, I mean, it's better than wasting it. Is it? Is it really? Gwyvin's going to look down into the hole it came from and see if there's other maybe victims or anything pulled down there. Are there bodies, people, anything like that? Go ahead and make a nature check. I'll give Gwyvin guidance on that. Yeah, and is there a tunnel down there? That would be a seven on my nature check. You can add two for what it's worth. Oh, sorry. That's a nine on my nature check. You don't see any kind of tunnels. What you do see is sort of a a large hole, almost like a crevasse that maybe it was resting in. Some space that maybe is about the same as the size of the creature that you just defeated. But with a nine, you can't really see more than that. You definitely don't see any other creatures like it down there. There is a hole down there. Anyone want to look? I don't. May as well leave well enough alone with that hole, maybe? As long as nothing looks like it's going to climb out after us again, I I don't need to put my face in a hole that had a monster in it. Yes, good thinking. Me neither. Can we use this creature's body somehow? Um, like a suit? Like, would you like to crawl into it and sort of move its arms around and walk oh, well, in and scare I, people? I hadn't thought of anything so baroque as that, but um, oh. I think there might be people in the chamber ahead of us. I'll say this sort of voce. I think that if we open the door quickly and maybe sort of hurled this giant insect's body through the door, it might serve as a distraction. They've gone silent. They might be waiting to hit us with something when we come in, you know, but it might throw them for a loop if they thought that this thing was coming after them. I sort of gesture for Gwyvin and Talingbet to pick up the creature's body to like hold it up off the ground a little bit in front of the door. Talingbet will attempt to assist with this. Gwyvin will as well. So when I see they're in position, I make a gesture like get ready to throw that thing through the door into the door, at least. I don't know if it's body, but like so its head goes through the door, maybe. And I will thaumaturgy and just like bang the door wide open, just like throw the door open. And and hopefully as soon as I do that, they will throw the thing's head through the door. And so, oh, oh, uh, Violet, can you use minor illusion to like make a horrifying sound like a horrifying insect sound? Oh, yes. Certainly. Okay, so, so all three of those things more or less simultaneously. Like a screaming horrible insect. I will bang the door open. They will throw the, the weekend at Ankeg body through. <laughs> so on three. <laughs> One, two, three. The door gets thrown open. There is an intense shriek of fear from several people on the other side of the door. <laughs> you will hear a, a male voice saying, Fools! Fools, what are you doing? And then you just hear footsteps running. Look, it's dead. Look, you fools. And then you just see from the other side, a dagger that pierces through the body of the Ankheg and it just comes through the other side. And then you see the barest glimpse of a robed figure on the other side. Human man, haggard, sweating, grizzled look, and his eyes look through the doorway and Spock Wyvern. Shit. Intruders, you fools, get back here! DM question. Would you say that I outwitted at least one foe there without <laughs> making a deception yes. or... <laughs> yes, I would, deception I would give or you the thumbs up on that one. That is definitely... Okay. Okay. I love it. Okay, I have gained... I have, I have, according to my destiny, gained inspiration as I please the trickster by outwitting a foe without Yay. using deception or perception. Okay, well, this guy's alone and his friends ran away, so let's get him. So let's go ahead and roll initiative again. Violet got a four. Mercury got a 13. Gwyvin got an 18. 
Is that door open? The door is open. Stumbling through the door is this guy dressed in purple robes. He doesn't look like the guy in your memories, though. He's got sort of a scarred and grizzled visage. He definitely doesn't look as sort of suave or as menacing as the guy who you remember from your visions. He is holding a dagger. The inside of his hand seems scarred and pitted, almost like he's used it for some kind of like burning ritual. He's got all kinds of tears in his cloak. As he stumbles in, I say, he he could be like us, remember? He could be like us, just knock him out. Well, he seemed to be in a group where he was saying, why are you fools running away? I know, but we don't know what we were doing at the bottom of that crypt, you know? We could kind of have a brain in his bug in his brain. A brain in his bug. Nice. Yep, his bugs could be full of brains. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to do, Gwyvin? Gwyvin is going to use his bonus action to disengage, and he's going to go behind Violet. And then since he has his crossbow <laughs> out, he's just going to shoot this guy with his crossbow. I rolled an eight. An eight is not enough, unfortunately. He dodges out of the way. Mm. And that's all I got. Mercury, you're up next. All right, I'm going to slip alongside him into the corner to give someone else an opportunity to flank him if they would like it. And I pull out my dagger, but I would like to try to pommel strike him with the dagger, like do non-lethal damage if I can. I try to hit him in the head with the dagger. So that is a 21 to hit. That hits. I guess it would do four non-lethal damage. Yeah, four bludgeoning damage. You whack him on the back of the head with your dagger. He goes, uh, and he just grunts at you, and his eyes are just bloodshot, and he, he stares menacingly uh, at you. I say, you're free? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem to have an effect. We are moving to Talingbet. Slingbet, seeing that this seems to have worked for Mercury uh, and that this guy has now turned to look at Mercury, I'm gonna step forward and move into that flanking position. And uh, he has his short sword out. He's similarly going to try and pommel strike the back of this guy's head that is now conveniently turned towards him with his short sword. Slingbet has a 21. 21 will hit, absolutely. And just conks this guy upside the back of the head for seven non lethal damage. Bam! Mercury hits him. Bam! Talingbit hits him, and he's just like, uh, stop hitting me! His face is all bloodied and bruised, but he is seemingly not stopping. He's he's just very violent. Violet, it's your turn. Oh, is that what we're doing? And then I'm going to walk right up to him. I'm oh my gonna god! Take out my quarter, my quarter step, and I'm gonna try to swing right at his face. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a two. So I'm so small that I take out my quarter step. And I drink this valiant swing and I just whiff it. Oh, nuts. Oh, that's it. Slingbit tries so hard not to laugh as you just completely miss this. <laughs> Violet, are you trained in medicine? Yes. Could you make a medicine check, please, for me? As you sort of swing and miss at this, at this guy? Yes, very much so. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> I, I added so many things and it's a four. Yeah, you're just so focused on beating the hell out of this guy that you really don't care what condition he's in or what potential problems he may have. So it doesn't really matter very much to you. It's now this guy's turn. He is surrounded on all sides. Mercury to the right of him. He's got Tilingba to the left. He's got Violet in front of him. And I'm just going to roll a D3 because he is done being a punching bag. Violet, it could be the fact that maybe he dodged out of the way of your attack, that he will reach towards you. And as you watch his hand, that hand that you saw that had all kinds of scars and stuff on it, starts to glow with a sort of purplish black light. And he reaches forwards and he grabs you by the shoulder. And this intense pain shoots through you oh, as he shield. attempts to cast a spell. He attempts to cast a spell, so you shield. And let's see what happens. He's going to cast a spell called Inflict Wounds. Oh, I love that. So what is your AC with shield? It is a 17. That is a 23 to hit. Damn it. Oh my goodness. Ouch. There is a lot of damage coming through here. This may be enough, unfortunately. I think she's one-shotted. I think this yeah. may, in fact, that's 25 necrotic damage. Okay, so, so wait. So the last thing that Violas does on this earthly plane is miss a pinata. <laughs> And, like, and I feel horrible because Tlingbet totally laughed at her adorable little miss. Yeah, that's more than double your current maximum hit points. Just by one, too. 
<laughs> oh no. Uh, is Mort still alive when you die? Oh yeah. He grabs Violet. Violet issues forth this awful, heart-wrenching scream as her bones melt, her skin just falls off of her face, and her body just turns to melted goop. And he cackles. That's his turn. Yeah, you just see, like, on top of Violet's remains, just the mouse. And he just squeaks angrily. Gwyvin, it's your turn. Gwyvin's going to take another shot with his crossbow, and he's just, he's going to kill this guy. That's a 25. That's a natural 20, sir. Oh, so with my sneak attack and the crit, I do 18 points of piercing damage. The arrow flies through the air over the remains of Violet's body and just hits him right in the chest, right above his heart. He gasps, he falls back against the wall. He's still alive, but just barely. That's Gwyvin's turn, that's all he's got. Okay, Mercury, you're up. Okay, I just look down at Violet's corpse in shock and dismay. I look back at him. I flip the dagger over in my hand so that the blade is facing him, and I just drive the dagger towards his throat. This will be with advantage, because I am flanking still. First attempt is at 11. Second attempt is an 8. Oh no, his AC is 12. It's not enough. I'm going to use my inspiration that I just got to re-roll that attack. Go for it. 18. That'll hit. Five slashing damage. You reverse grip and s- just stab right into his chest. He screams in pain. His eyes roll back into his head and he falls to the ground dead. I immediately stoop by Violet. I kind of know the answer, but I'm just frantically checking to see if there's anything I can do. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm just there a puddle. There is little left. Gwyvin is going to ready his crossbow in case anyone else comes through that door. He's just going to shoot whoever comes through. What does he see? Yeah, sleep is right there. So what, what is on the other side of the door? Through the door, you see that there's another passageway that goes another 10 feet. It seems to open into a larger chamber. And then beyond that, another passageway going even further down with another set of stairs to another door. No more people that I see beyond the door. No, there are no more people that you can see. Tlingbet pauses for a moment, kneels, kneels next to the, the puddle uh, and tries to recover Mort. <laughs> From the goo. Yay! And just kind of holds up Mort, looks him straight in the eye and says, I am not sure that I like you, but I will do my best to keep you (laughs) alive-ish. I say, sleep peacefully, Violet. We'll get to the bottom of this madness. For you. Right? I look up to you, Tlingbet and Gwyvin. We'll finish it for her. Yes. Gwyvin's eyes are full of tears, which is something you haven't really seen, and he just nods. Tlingbet just looks kind of overwhelmed right now. Just nods solemnly. No choice but to try to get to the bottom of it, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mercury will communicate at this point. He has one spell slot left. He's going to hang on to that for one last healing spell if somebody goes down. But other than that, that's, that's what I got. Lingbet looks back and forth the other two and says, well, you are both very small. And then proceeds into the next room. <laughs> Gwyvin's going to take off his cloak and cover Violet. I will cast Guidance on myself and then try to sneak. Gwyvin rolled a 19. Mercury got a 14. Tlingbet has a 17. Sounds like Tlingbet's going first. Yes. I'll follow Tlingbet. And Gwyvin will go last. As he goes into the next room, his tail is just kind of like swishing back and forth angrily. The room that you enter seems to have a whole bunch of detritus and rubble and refuse on the eastern side of it. You see another stairwell about 15 feet from your position. I think we just keep, keep creeping up the stairs. Yes. Or down the stairs, if they're going down. Down the stairs, stairs. yeah. Tlingbet has a singularity of of purpose and downwards. The tunnel seems to make an entire U-turn, opens up to, instead of five feet, now it's ten feet wide. You now see light issuing forth from a large chamber that these stairs descend into. This chamber has a stone floor, stone walls just like the ones that you've been in before. There seem to be wooden pews. Four of them, set up in a two-by-two two fashion, facing some kind of a altar that actually make it kind of look like a cruder version of the complex that you all woke up in not that long ago. Facing away from you is a dark-robed figure dressed in purple. What do you want to do? Shoot him in the back? Uh, yeah, Tlingbet is not slowing his approach. He's, he's just continuing. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he has his sword drawn. He's he's walking in. <laughs> I'm assuming the other two of you going along with. Yeah. OK, cool. Yep. As you do so, this figure turns in your direction, gradually revealing 
that face, that sort of thin, menacing, dark-eyed face that you remember being underneath the cowl of that purple robe, the same one that brought you perhaps into servitude of this cult. There is a golden-winged insect sigil emblazoned across this figure's front. And as you enter to Lingbet, he says, Well, if it isn't our little lost lambs come back to the fold, how lovely. And smiles at you beatifically. Don't worry. Our master left me a gift so that I could start my own family. Stay. Let me share it with you. And we'll be one again. And as he says this distantly from a small chamber to the figure's right, enclosed by a wooden door, comes a clamor of voices. And you recognize one of them as Belton's. And he says, Hey, whoever is out there, get us out of this hellhole! And then another voice. Yes, yes, please help us! And you recognize this voice from the fact that it's yelling as the same voice that you heard escaping from Northminster. This is the voice of Tariq Crestvale. Lingbit just locks eyes with this man who is standing at the far side of the room and says, You, you are the thing I do not like. I do not like you personally. He just smiles at you and opens his arms and says, You may adore me then. Lingbet would just be crossing, crossing the room towards him. Yeah. You've played with our brains and our lives and it's cost the life of a friend. Here's where we put a stop to it. And over my shoulder, I say to Gwyvin, Belton and the captain are locked in that room. If you can get that lock open, maybe they can help us. Already on it. Also start moving in on this guy. I'm going to, if he doesn't do anything to stop me, I'm going to produce flame again and throw it at him. Okay, yeah, he doesn't stop you. But as you produce flame, his smile turns into a frown and he says, how disappointing. He turns to his right where there is another door and he says, I'm afraid we're going to have to deal with them in the same fashion as the others, gentlemen. And the door flies open. And that same group of men who you saw retreating from the room that you were in before now come forth. Their eyes are wide. They look absolutely frightened out of their wits, but they brandish daggers and start running in your direction. Let's roll initiative. Thanks for listening. This episode featured the Dungeon Master stylings of Matt Gordon with Tal Aviazer as Mercury. Carolyn Fox as Violet, Rachel Savicki as Tlingbet, and me, Andy Canistra, as Gwyvin. This episode was edited by Carolyn Fox and Tal Aviazer. Our original theme music is by Lauren Anker and Anthony Damaso. Remember, if you enjoy Podcast Party, please follow the show, rate us, and leave us a review. Thanks very much for listening. We'll be back in one week with a new episode of Podcast Party, Descent into Avernus, and in two weeks with the thrilling conclusion of Memories of Holdenshire.